Oh, hello. Uh, <laughs> this is Sadius. Welcome to episode two of KSP 101. Um, this is going. This episode is going to cover achieving orbit, doing orbital mechanics, and all sorts of fun jazz that you need to know before you start going into more advanced things such as landing on other celestial bodies or transferring to other bodies or whatever. We're going to cover just some basic bits on that. Um, if you're coming here from the previous episode, welcome. Please continue on. And um, if you kind of know how to do this kind of stuff, then I'm going to go ahead and provide a card for you to go to the next episode, which the next episode is going to be um, how to land and um, doing things related to the ground. Um, possibly also docking. I might do just, I might touch on it and then do advanced docking later. Um, but yeah, go ahead and enjoy. Uh, I'm not going to provide any timestamps because it's only going to, it's only one topic that I'm covering. Um, I will put some chapters in there so you can go ahead and just click through and you can see what things are that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, but other than that, hope you enjoy uh, episode two of KSP 101. Hello friends, this is Savius, and uh, welcome to my tutorial series that I'm going to end up just calling KSP 101 because why the heck not? Uh, this is part two of my tutorial where um, today I'm going to be showing you how to achieve orbit. Um, as you can see here, this is a rocket. Yes, it's a rocket, but it's a modified rocket, I know. I said last video that I would use as many vanilla parts as possible, but I figured that this rocket would be a nice looking demonstrator vehicle for what we're going to be doing. Uh, it's a lengthened Atlas rocket with the stage and a half configuration underneath there so we can I can explain what boosters do, etc. Um, and then it has a decent orbital propulsion system at the top that um, I can use for orbital maneuvering demonstrations and whatnot. So, um, you have built your rocket. It's ready to go. And you are ready to launch. And if you follow along with the instructions of the previous video, you, knew, you know that you should probably press T to enable sickness avoidance system. And then throttle's down here at the bottom, so you should probably hold shift or press Z to maximize throttle. Okay, everything looks great there. Before we launch, make sure to check your staging. So. Here we have eight stages. The first one's going to going to disengage the launch clamp and fire the engines. The next stage is going to separate the booster skirt. The next stage is going to separate the main lifter body and fire the sustainer stage that I have here. The next stage will separate the service module and separate the launch escape tower. The launch escape tower is also bound to the abort key in case anything were to wildly go wrong for whatever reason. Then, the service module engine will fire once it's separated on a separate stage. And then after we've done our orbital maneuvering things, I always like to include on my early rockets some retro motors, just because um, on some of the modded parts there's sometimes not enough fuel to do a whole orbital mission but on their own, so the solid fuel motors are fine. Um, then the service module separates and then the drogue chute arms, and then the main parachute deploys. Um, you can see on these parachutes, the drogue, share, the drogue chute deploys at 7,000 meters, and the main chute deploys at 1,000. Uh, just keep that in mind when we are doing the last part of the tutorial. So now everything's set up, we know our staging is correct, we have SAS on, we have the throttle on. Last thing that we have left to do is to launch. So just our spacebar, you know. Now I've gone ahead and I've reduced the audio on it because it turns out in the original clip it's a little bit loud, but um, we're basically just going to cover um, basic flight, and uh, once you've gotten off the launch pad, you're just going to want to stay as straight as possible, going up to about 2,000, maybe 3,000 meters, uh, as you can see on the ticker up there above. Uh, right around 2000, I believe, is where I start pitching. Um, basically, on the nav ball, you can see all those numbers there. The numbers are notched horizontally for how many degrees upwards from the horizon. 
facing perfectly up is about 90 degrees and it goes in increments of 10, 80, 70, 60, so on. Uh, you'll see a little marks there that looks like a halo around it and it says like 45, 90, 270 or whatever. That is your compass bearings uh, with the little red stripe being north and 90 being going, e going uh, eastwards. So just keep pitching um, slightly. By the time that you reach about 14 kilometers, 15 kilometers or so, you should be about 45 from horizon. Simply depends on uh, your orbital information. If you've got back Jeb, you can see up there in the orbital information. You can see that um, it says whatever the aprolapse is. The aprolapse is your highest point on the orbit. So um, a good stable orbit at the lowest would be right around uh, 100 kilometers or so. That's about 100,000 meters. You can see there, I've, I've separated the booster skirt. I've forgotten to separate it in flight because <laughs> I was busy recording it, but it was too loud anyways. Went ahead and separate the main stage as well since so it's empty. And now we've got what's called a sustainer stage. Basically, it's a vacuum-optimized engine that is mounted onto an extended fuel tank to actually uh, propel a spacecraft in the vacuum. Um, now, the other way to check your um, aprolapse and periapse height, you can see there the periapse is now starting to raise up a little bit. Um, at this point, you can cut off your engines here, which is what I'm going to do, and then to, to check without using any mods, uh, pardon the flickering on the map, there's just a small issue with one of the mods that I'm running. You can see there the aprolapse is labeled with the height. You can click there and that'll open up your maneuver. In order to circularize your orbit or to park in orbit, you need to burn prograde. That's what that little icon there is. Uh, as you burn prograde, you can see the little yellow line grows. That is your projected trajectory. When you right click the icons, it can show you the, it'll show you the values without needing to mouse over them. Once you've circularized to your desired altitude, you can see that the amount of burn time, when you need to burn, and then you'll see down there it's when the burn will occur, and then you see when you need to burn. On the left side, if you have fully upgraded astronauts, you can click the maneuver tool and it will tell your astronauts to keep pointing at maneuver, but we don't have that right. If, if you're starting out in career, you may not have that. As soon as that number at the bottom reaches zero, you ignite your engine, and then those numbers ticking down on the right side, that is how much time and how much velocity change is remaining. This term is called delta V, or delta velocity. Um, it basically just tells you how much of a velocity change you can actually make while you're in space. Um, it's just a graphical display that helps you see how much more burn time you have left. There you can see on the left side it says probably 1900 or so um, meters per second delta V. Um, that basically tells you how much maneuver time is left on that stage, how much maneuver space you basically have, and then the numbers will tick down, and by the time they reach zero, uh, you'll have completed your maneuver. You can see when we go into the map view that the um, trajectory is very slowly starting to grow. Um, so what, what's basically happening is when we took off from Kerbal Space Center, we're basically we're, we were going up, but you actually need to think of it as we're just going out from the planet, and so if we were just to keep going that way. Uh, we wouldn't have any sideways velocity. Okay, so we wouldn't really be going away from Kerbin, we'd be just going up and then we would come back down. So we need to introduce some horizontal velocity as well. Because and you can't just have you can't just have horizontal and you can't just have vertical. So instead you have to make a curve. And then that curve, once you reach the top of it, you need to ignite your engine again and continue that curve. And that curve will eventually go around the planet, as you can see right there, goes around the planet. And then it comes up on the other end, and by when it goes above the atmosphere, which you can throttle down for more precise maneuvering, um, once it goes over the atmosphere, then you are good to go. And once that's done, you've got your desired altitudes, you can click that little green check mark, and it will delete the maneuver. And then you can check your apoapse and periapse, 
And if they're over a hundred thousand meters, then you have made a stable orbit over Kerbin. Now that we're in space, I'm going to click Maintain Prograde. I'm going to tell it to go ahead and separate the service module. Don't worry about the tank, it's just going to float around and be some kind of satellite or something. Now, here you can notice, if you go ahead and start trying to rotate, you'll notice that you can rotate, you can do all sorts of things. This is, this is because your spacecraft is outfitted with reaction wheels. Reaction wheels are gyroscopes that spin rapidly in one direction, and of course, following Newton's law of motion, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. So when the wheels spin one direction, the spacecraft will rotate in the other direction. Okay, so that's what's going on there. And to further prove this, we can go here, inside the capsule. Now you see in here, should be a button that says toggle torque. You see that? We click that. What we basically did now is we have disabled those reaction wheels. Why would we want to do that? Well, in your resources window, you can see all the different resources that are on your ship. Electric charge is very precious. If you don't have any solar panels or any way of generating electricity, that is the limiting factor for your missions. Okay. So without using reaction wheels, we're basically saving some electric charge. If I turn this back on, and I rotate, you can see there's increased consumption. Okay, you can see that. Well, to save on consumption, we can turn on RCS, or Reaction Control System. Now, instead of using the reaction wheels, we use controlled thrusters of fuel that is called monopropellant in Kerbal Space Program real life it would be called hydrazine or something like that. This is about as real this is as realistic of maneuvering as we can get is that to actually use this instead of reaction wheels. You can see the force is a little bit less, but it's adequate. I mean we're not doing any we're not doing any precision maneuvers here or anything, but you can see that's this is basically how how you would maneuver. And again the the rocket controls for maneuvering space in the same WASD Q and E. Now, just for, sake, for the sake of convenience, I am going to enable torque on this because when you have torque and you have the reaction control thrusters, you get something that's a little bit more stable. There's another function of these that I'm going to show you, and that is instead of using WASD, using the I, J, K, and L keys. Now, that's for translation. You can also click on docking mode, and you can see there's two modes, linear and rotation, and I have, I have not used this mode in so long I've forgotten how to use it, but when going to docking mode you can see different, different thrusters fire, and this is hard to see because we don't have anything to reference, but what this basically does is instead of rotating the craft, it translates it linear, linearly along the X, Y, and Z planes. This is this is pivotal for docking, okay? And why I say using the I, J, K, and L is because if we go back to just if we go back to regular old staging mode like this, we can still use the translation keys using the I, J, K, and L keys. Corresponding also are the H and N keys. N goes backwards, and H goes forwards, but we don't have any forward-facing thrusters. I can go ahead and engage the orbital maneuvering thrusters, and you see they still don't work because that's an engine. It's not an RCS system, it's an engine. So to go forward, we would just press, we would just hold shift. Now you see that little tiny piece of debris out there. Before we go over into the dark side of the planet, I'm going to try and position ourselves close to the piece of debris so we can, so I can just show you the, um, the method of translation that you can see me using the translation keys here. What it's doing to the velocity. 
it's actually changing our velocity vector rather than actually rotating the craft. Now that we're here, we can throttle up a little bit, line it up, throttle up a little bit more. Now we're at seven. This is orbital maneuvering. We can open up the map. And you see now there's a green line intersecting with our blue line. There's a lot more information on this screen. There is the blue apparatus, which is us, and the green apparatus, which is the target apparatus. We've also got a little blue node that says DN and AN. These are as a descending node and ascending node. Thankfully, due to Euclidius um, and us having basic geometry, any intersecting ellipses will have exactly two points where their lines meet on one side and on the other, exactly mirrored to each other. And that difference of angle basically determines, um, you know, basically determines just the, the angle of those lines, how quickly you're going to be going up and down. Now you can see we're approaching this piece of space debris. And that's what orbital maneuvering does. It allows you to very gently go around any object that you want to intercept. Going back to this map view, we can see these, these orange and purple nodes. These are your approach vectors. Okay, so this is close intersect to, these are your intercepts where in the orbit you're going to be closest to the object that you're, well, intercepting. You can see here, intercept two. Purple is always intercept two, and orange is always intercept one. You can see separation is 13 kilometers, relative speed 45 meters per second, and you'll intercept in 30 minutes, thereabouts. Same thing here, about 15 kilometers, 44 meters per second, etc. Well, at these points, if you're trying to intercept your, in this case, a piece of space debris, these are your closest points, and these are where you can see this says target, because we have a target. We can switch it to orbit, surface, and target. This basically changes This basically changes where the nodes are going to be relative to your nav ball. You can see here we have a whole bunch of different nodes, and here we have a whole bunch of other different nodes, and here we have other nodes. I'm about to explain what all these nodes do. So we're facing Cur we're facing Kerbin now. We're on the dark side. If we go here and we just go to make a node. We have a whole bunch of wacky symbols, okay? If I press tab, I can't, well, I guess it won't really focus on that one. There we go. Now it will. Now these nodes, we're not gonna do any maneuvering with this node, so don't worry about the timing or anything. This node basically has six different icons for you to manipulate, and you can manipulate where the node is itself, okay? You can also right click the middle of the node and you can have these two buttons here. We'll explain those in a second. These represent the six, the, yeah, the six planar directions that you can maneuver in space. Prograde, retrograde, radial in, radial out, normal, and anti-normal. Now what does this all mean? Well. Prograde and retrograde are the easiest and most self-explanatory. When you're orbiting around a planet, let's delete this node here. This is us, right, Tutorial Gemini. If I do a little bit of time warp, you'll notice this is the path we're taking in orbit, right? Well, if I go back and make a new node, We can see that this icon is going 
in the path of the orbit. Okay. When you burn along the same vector of your orbit, a vector is a point of velocity with direction. If you burn prograde vector, watch what happens to your aprolapse here, because we're at periapse. It increases, okay? It increases. If you burn retrograde at the same point, it'll decrease, okay? Now, radial in and radial out. These two nodes and these two nodes are strictly in reference to the planet that you're orbiting. So, radial in is when you point your nose directly at the planet. Okay? When you're landing, you can't just point your nose at the planet and burn, because look what happens. Okay? See what happens here? It changes your orbit thusly. This is if you were to point towards the planet. This is if you were to point away from the planet. And you see, it takes a lot of force to do that. So that's not really advised. Next is normal and anti-normal. Normal, imagine if your rocket was a person, normal would be if it were standing up in reference to north. Okay, so north is that way. Normal is that way. North is up. Kind of. There is no up in space. But there can be in reference to the planet. Normal can be considered up in reference to your orbital path. Now, if you were going the other way, if you're going this way, normal would also be like this. But prograde would be going in the opposite direction. That's called a retrograde orbit. We are in a prograde orbit. Now, if you were to change your normal, that's what occurs. Your orbit becomes more angled in both directions. But notice while doing this, you can see our aprolapse is also increasing. Now I'm no rocket scientist so I can't really explain that, but just know that when you're doing this, you're also going to have to compensate with this. And when you do so, notice as well, now that you're angled, see what happens? Okay. You can see it takes a lot of power to do that. Okay. Now, there's one more thing that we're going to do, and that is we're going to use our applied new theory of orbital mechanics and maneuvering to intercept the MUN. You can click the MUN and you can click set as target. You now see the same display that we had with the space debris. Here we see descending node and ascending node of, and you can see negative 0.2 degrees, positive 0.2, okay? That's fine. Uh, in fact, the sphere of influence of the moon is so big and the distance is so close that we don't really need to worry about changing our orbital plane to meet the moon. Now we just eyeball now. Note, we're moving, so is the moon, okay? So, I'm going to estimate right around here because I've been doing this for <laughs> eons. And so now we are going to burn prograde all the way up till our orbital line meets that. Now you can see we've got two little nodes here. This is target position at closest approach. Basically this says that's where our spacecraft is going to be on our orbital path and that's basically telling us where the planet is or the moon is or whatever we're intercepting. Okay. We can get this closer by multiple means. One way is to keep burning prograde, but that doesn't seem to work for this occurrence, okay? The next is to burn radial. That would change the ejection angle that we're leaving the planet at. That can work if you burn at the right angle and you spend enough fuel, you'll notice that these nodes are getting closer, right? But it's still not good enough, right? Still not good enough. Okay, there's something different that we gotta do. Okay, 
the last thing that we can do is we can change the time at which we need to burn. So we can we can drag this along our orbital path, and you can see it's going to happen later and later, and you can see our node here is getting closer and closer. If you right-click a node, that will pin it on your screen so that you don't have to constantly mouse over it. Just keep dragging and dragging and dragging, and oh, look at that. Now you see, this is the one unique thing that planets and moons do that orbiting anything else, that intercepting anything else does not do. This is an encounter node. It says Mun Encounter. It shows you, it doesn't show you that, but it also shows you, you can see this little purple line here where the Mun is going to be, a little purple line showing where your trajectory is going to go relative to the moon. And then this green line is where your orbit is going to be after you've gone past the moon, once you've escaped the moon, okay? This is a really big orbit, a nine day orbit. Um, just for limitations and because of my mods and I don't want to watch Kerbal's die today, if we go here and we click on life support, I've only got two days of food here. I don't think I can make a trip to the moon. That's going to, moon encounters three hours, so on. So we can probably do like a, a moon flyby. So that's what we're gonna do. If we click this, we can focus view. Now we're focusing our view of the moon, and now, look at this. We can clearly see what our spacecraft is going to do in the orbit of the moon. Now just for showsies, I'm going to open the maneuver, and there's one more thing. You'll see when you open a maneuver, you get this new maneuver window editor. That's great. If we go here, graphical maneuver editor, you can see, ah, You've got the same nodes from before, and you've got this little, this little slider. There's scale down there. That basically tells you at what speed you're going to be orbiting. You're or changing your orbit. I'm going to turn it down to about 0.2, so you can see this happen. If I click, if I click that and just pull it gently, you can see what's happening with the orbit. Right, it's changing. Now I'm going to turn this up a little bit. I'm going to pull the blue one. And you can see, look, our orbit got closer. That's great, isn't it? Okay. That's perfect. That's going to cost us 852 meters per second of delta V. I've got 1,182. So now, we're going to change our view back to our ship. In two minutes, we're going to do the burn. Now you can see there's a blue arrow here on the on the nav ball, and you don't see the node anywhere. The blue button is the node. One thing to note before you start doing these maneuvers too, um, this is more for interplanetary transfers and what have you, but your RCS delivers thrust. So the, these are engines on your spacecraft. They produce thrust. That will make a difference in your maneuver. So if you're doing further maneuvers, like if you'll note, one thing to note is the more that you burn, the further out you go, the more sensitive your end position and end velocity is going to be per delta V spent at the node. Okay, so if you spend a little bit of delta V way out here, it's going to make it way out there. Okay. If your approlapse is say, out here, one meter per second spent of fuel is going to change this to where you may not intercept Duna anymore. You'll have to do mid-course correction. That's delta V wasted. So whenever I do body transfer nodes, I just shut off RCS and use the reaction wheels to do it because that just costs electricity. We've got plenty of electricity. I can click maneuver. The reaction wheels will point the spacecraft at the node and they'll keep them there. And now we have 47 seconds, so now I'm just going to tap the forward time warp key, that's the greater than sign. You keep counting it down, be very careful. You don't want to miss your burn. And then once you've reached zero, Tap Z, you're now at full thrust, 
and you're beginning your maneuver to the Mun. While this is going on, you can hold down Alt and press Greater Than to use Physics Warp in Space. You can go all the way up to 4x. I've got a mod that lets me go further, but I'm not going to use that. But we're just going to keep on burning that. If we open up our map key, you can see our apoapse is increasing. Okay, because we're adding velocity to this, we are going to be shooting further, right? Equal and opposite reactions. You're basically coasting. You know, you're putting on the gas now. And then once this burn is complete, you are going to coast. You're, you've put your foot off the gas. You're going to keep coasting along this line. You've got 60 meters per second remaining. That's about 10 seconds. You can see it there, 10 second burn remaining. And you see, look at that. That's an intercept. Now, that is one intercept. But I'm going to keep burning this one. Keep burning, keep burning. And done. You see, 0 0.1 meter per second tolerance. Looks about right. And there we go, 38 meters, 38 kilometers. <coughs> Excuse me. Now that we're there, we have 316 meters per second in delta V remaining. I don't think that's enough to circularize our orbit and escape the moon. No, it's, it's enough to circularize and stay there forever. So we're not going to do that. But we are going to fly by. But you'll notice we'll fly by and we'll escape. You see that there? It says Kerbin Escape. We'll go out into space, to deep space. We've got about four hours. How long? Two days. We've got two days worth of life support. I don't fancy being a permanent resident of space. We gotta fix that, don't we? There's a few things that we can do. Now, we're going in this direction. And you'll notice we'll fly by the moon. Now notice that this line is different from this line. That's just relative to the moon, okay? When we're going this way, we're still gonna be going this way. We're just slightly altered by the gravity of the moon. The moon has very very low gravity, okay? We can prove that right here. The moon has very low gravity, okay? About just under two-tenths Kerbin's gravity, okay? So we're gonna have a velocity and trajectory change. Before we get there, remember what I said earlier, that maneuvers back here will be more sensitive then up here. Okay, that's how levers work. So we're gonna go here, we're gonna change our, our maneuver a little bit. Now you see that this is, once we leave and go out of here, we're going prograde, right? If I go here, change it in that direction, we're now going retrograde, okay? We're now going retrograde. This is called an ejection angle. Changing your ejection angle costs a lot less. Most of the time costs a lot less. And has good effects on what you're doing once you leave. Okay, so we want to return to Kerbin, right? Without this node, we're escaping. If I put this node here and we change our ejection angle, look what's happening to our velocity. It's changing too. Now that we're going retrograde from the moon, we now have this. And you can see our orbit terminates at the surface. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a controlled crash. <laughs> so, we will do that. Simply because we need to get our kerbals home. Okay, so that's going to occur in two minutes. If we click this button here, the game will automatically time warp us to that point there. But it'll only do it up to a minute. After that, 
you have to do the rest. Which, you know, that's fine. Just go there. Ready to burn. Sixteen second burn. See, I cut that off a little bit early there, and it, was, it had a red X on there. That meant that I was not within error. So now we have that. That is very clearly within error. And it says that our app wraps is going to be in two days. Running a little bit close to life support limits. But we're going to go ahead and time warp then. We have 211 meters per second remaining. It's probably going to take us two days regardless of how fast we go, and there's nothing that we can do that would make it go faster. Yeah, we can see the electricity is running out. I think this has a uh, fuel cell. Yes, fuel cell. Now, fuel cells, basically, what they do is they use whatever fuel is inside for whatever they're designed to use to generate electricity. So we can click start fuel cell. And now you can see it's consuming monopropellant. And in response, we're now building electric charge. If we disable SAS, a disable torque like we did before, that's going to save a little bit on our electricity. Because if we have to do any more maneuvers, we'll then have to use monopropellant. But that resource is very scant. But now that we have positive generation of electric charge, we can safely continue. And I can say safely because we don't really need to do any more maneuvers with our monopropellant. So we're good to go. Now we can say that we can click here and we can see that it's going to take one day to get to that point. Just for gameplay reasons, I'm going to check this. Food remaining two days, etc. We're good. So now we're going to go ahead and just fly by the moon. See it there. We're going to fly by. We've done it. We've flown by. And just for continuity, make sure that you do the science while you're there. Okay? Make sure you do the science. Go over here, you see crew report, click that. I'm in my other creative save, so it's not going to have any values, but basically just keep them. And one thing that you can do that you can't really do right off the bat, but I recommend doing it as soon as you can. It is to do some kind of spacewalk. See where it says go EVA here? EVA means extravehicular activity. Click that. And your equipment goes outside of the spacecraft. Outside of the spacecraft, they can do an EVA report. You can keep the experiment. And then, and then you can see EVA report while well, it's twice high over the moon added to the command pod. We now have two science experiments in here that we have completed. And now we're just going to continue our flight past the moon. Something else to note too is for these science for these sciencey bits. I'm gonna open up MechJeb here. And I'm going to open up surface info. The surface info is pretty important in space too. Mostly because current biome. Science is a biome-based topic in Kerbal Space Program. You will gain science per biome per planet. Per altitude. You can see it says, space just above the mountain midlands. 
if we were to get out and do another EVA report, we would get more science. And if we went over the craters, we would get another science report, and that would be another bit of science. And so it goes on and on. We have just above, there's high over, and there's on the surface. And then same thing over Kerbin as well, and all the other planets, Moho, Duna, all of them, same thing. Um, per location, you can do different science experiments to gain more science, basically. You can see here too, a little green Kerbal, but look, not connected, no data, no signal. If we open this up, you can see our spacecraft is behind Kerbin, okay? I mean, it's behind the Mun. The Mun is between our spacecraft and Kerbin. We're in what's called signal blackout. That basically means they can't connect to us because there's no radio connection anywhere. If we had a satellite, say, out here, out here in this spot, the signal could bounce between this to the satellite, and from the satellite to the capsule, and we would have communication on the dark side. But we don't have that right now, so we're just going to have to live with the signal blackout. It's all good. The Kerbals are smart enough anyways. But you'll see once we go back from the other side of the moon, see the green line? That green line means a good signal directly to Kerbal Space, Kerbal Space Center. You can see that there. Direct connection to Space Center. That can change if you've got a relay or whatever. So yes, we're just going to continue on down. Just let it take us away. We're coming down over the over Kerbin, as you can see. I'm going to enable torque again because we've got plenty of electric charge. And I'm going to go ahead and disable the fuel cell because we're going to have enough electric charge to enter the atmosphere. Let's face retrograde. And for reference to, if you want to turn on the lights on a, on a vehicle, press U. And that will turn on the lights. We're going to go ahead and separate the capsules. Now you saw there was an error with our staging there that I just fixed. You can fix staging mid-flight. Just keep that in mind, it's just like the editor. But now we're going to separate the service module because you can see there's no heat shield down there. I actually did not need to fix my staging, that's actually perfect. But you can see the service module has a decoupler and then the capsule. We need to separate the service stage, but before we do, we've got some SRBs that I can fire. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Now this is just preference, you don't have to have that, but I do. It's just for that little extra bit of realism. Once that's all done and everything is basically spent, you separate the service module, and now you can see there's a heat shield under here with a blader. Now we're going to watch this when we go in the atmosphere, because going into the atmosphere will cause this to take damage, and ablator allows the heat shields to take damage without actually exploding. The other thing I'm going to demonstrate here, we've got two parachutes in this system, okay? We've got the drogue chute, and we've got the main parachute inside this protective cone. If I click spacebar right now, it says here, Deploy mode when safe. If I click this, it changes to a light blue color. That means the parachute is armed. So now that it's armed, we're ready to go. We can go ahead and time warp a little bit more. You'll notice up here that says 11.5k and dropping at about a thousand. Okay, 11k is or um, 1,100k, that's kilometers. So we are about 1,088 kilometers 
and we can see that right here altitude 1 million 80 meters okay if you don't know metric I really recommend you learn it it's really simple but for scale about how high we are a meter is about the length of a yard and there's a thousand meters in a kilometer and we're a thousand kilometers over the surface of Kerbin. So just keep that in mind about how fast we're going. Okay, you can see that here too. We're going at 1.8 kilometers per second. It's 1,800 meters per second, 1 1.8 kilometers. And we're getting faster too. Coming in faster. Now we know that the atmosphere begins at Kerbin at 70,000 meters or 70 kilometers. Okay, so we are still a good bit away from that, but we are very rapidly approaching it at about two kilometers per second. Now here we are. We've just reached 100 kilometers. Okay, there's 90. Okay, we're coming in three kilometers per second. Okay, that is extremely fast. We may not even survive this, and that might be pretty funny, you know? The spirit of a Kerbal Space Program. Now you can see the heat shield is lighting up, and we've got re-entry effects. If I right-click this, look at how fast that ablator is being spent. Okay. Now it's a good thing that I armed that drogue shoot, because you see that G-meter went up really high. I don't think my save has Kerbal G-forces enabled, but if it is, your Kerbals would have just blacked out, and you would not have been able to control the spacecraft. But you can see, we basically went in, we're fine. We can disable SAS because the parachute will stabilize us. Now once we reach around 2,000 meters, we're going to press spacebar again, and that will deploy our main chute. You can see our drug chute is slowing us down enough to a safe enough velocity where it's safe to open it. You can see earlier when we were going into the atmosphere, that it was considered unsafe, it was a red color, but now a green colored parachute, that means the parachute has, well, deployed. And now that the parachute is deployed, we are safely descending over Kerbin's oceans. Again, we can speed this up with time warp. And there we go. They've made it safely to the surface of Kerbin. Finish the mission by recovering the vessel. That is done. Again, we're in a creative save, so everything's already upgraded. We didn't have anything to gain, but that was that. That concludes the end of this tutorial. We have talked about achieving orbit, doing orbital maneuvering, planning maneuvers, and intercepting um, not only spacecraft, but also um, stellar bodies as well. The next tutorial, I'm going to cover docking. I'm going to cover um, intercepting smartly. And then we're going to cover, um, I don't know. We'll see how it goes from there. We'll probably cover uh, landing or something. I don't know. We'll see. Either way, I hope you all enjoyed. This has been Savius, signing off.